So far on the Based on a True Story podcast, we've covered over 70 movies. Some of them are the biggest blockbusters coming out of Hollywood like Titanic, The Sound of Music, Lawrence of Arabia, and The Ten Commandments. Being some of the highest grossing films in cinematic history, it's probably safe to assume if you haven't seen those movies, you've at least heard of them. Some of the movies we've looked at are smaller films though. Movies like Bitter Harvest, Walt Before Mickey, and Cadillac Records that, based on the box office numbers alone, it's very possible you haven't seen. Today, we're going to cover a movie that sits between those two extremes. It's one of those films where, if you've heard of it, you've almost certainly seen it. But if we're basing things on box office numbers, that doesn't necessarily mean you've heard of it. Made with a budget of about $11 million, it managed to earn about twice that at the box office. While doubling an $11 million budget is pretty good profit, it's nowhere near the billions of dollars that Titanic ranked in. Then again, not everyone's into kung fu movies, but if you are, you've already seen 2008's Ip Man. But do you know the real story behind the kung fu masterpiece? I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is based on a true story. It's time for Two Truths and a Lie. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode. Then, by process of elimination, you'll know which one was a lie. We'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Okay, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, the real Ip Man never fought a Japanese general like we saw in the movie. Number two, Ip Man lived in Hong Kong before World War II. Number three, Ip Man never trained anyone at a cotton mill. Before we dive into our story today, I'd like to offer a quick shout out to the two listeners who requested this movie. That'd be Sam Fredrickson and Lynn Shirley. I'd seen Ip Man many years ago when it was first released, but it was great to go back, watch it again, and dive into the research for this. So thanks for the suggestion, Sam and Lynn. And with that, let's compare history with Ip Man. Our movie today begins with some text on screen that explains our story is set in a city that has a reputation for martial arts, Foshan, in the year 1935. After this, we're introduced to Ip Man as played by Donnie Yen for the first time. And when we are, we can clearly see that he's living in a very lavish home. The movie is correct in showing a rather lavish home, as Ip Man was born on October 1st, 1893, in Foshan. That's a city in the Guangdong province of China, which is on the southern coast of the massive country. It's only about 150 miles, or 240 kilometers, to the north of Hong Kong. As the 19th century turned to the 20th, Ip Man benefited from his parents' wealth as he received a much higher level of education than most others his age in the early 20th century. There's no documented proof of when he started learning martial arts, but most agree it was probably around the age of 13 when he began learning a form of Kung Fu known as Wing Chun, or sometimes called Wing Sun. To give you an idea of some of the great education Ip Man enjoyed, At age 15, he moved to Hong Kong so he could attend a secondary school called St. Stephen's College. Or was that at the age of 18? There are some conflicting reports about exactly when Ip Man attended school. While he was in school, though, he continued his Kung Fu training under a man named Leong Bik, who himself was the son of Leong Zhan, a man who some credits with creating the three hand forms that are primarily used in the modern Wing Chun style. By the time Ip Man returned to Foshan at the age of 24, his martial arts skills had grown immensely. They only continued to grow as the years wore on. Fast forward a few decades, and we're about to the point of the timeline in the film, where, in 1935, Ip Man would have been 42 years old and legendary in his skills. Going back to the movie, there's a couple other characters that are subtly introduced in the beginning. Living along with Master Ip in his beautiful home are his wife and son. In the movie, Master Ip's wife, Jung, is played by Lin Hung, while his son, Zun, is played by Lee Chak. This brings up a great point that I should address up front. 
As you can tell from what I'm saying at this moment, this podcast isn't in Cantonese, the language the majority of Foshan citizens speak. It's not in Cantonese because I don't speak Cantonese. As I've mentioned before on this podcast, unfortunately, English is my only language. The reason I mention this is to be upfront because all of the research that I've done for this requires that it's translated into English. That can mean there are differences in the words. And perhaps it's most notable in different names. For example, Ip Man himself is sometimes referred to as Yip Man or Yi Wen or Yip Kai Man. So Ip Man is I-P-M-A-N. But sometimes Yip Man is Y-I-P-M-A-N. Similarly, in the movie, we see Master Ip's son is cast in English as Zun, Z-H-U-N. However, his name in nearly all of the research that I came across was Ip Chun, C-H-U-N. Oh, and if you're like me and don't speak Cantonese, the surname is flipped. So Ip, I-P, is the surname. Here in the United States, where I'm from, the first name is spoken first, the surname is spoken last. That's the opposite of Cantonese. So again, Ip is the surname. Anyway, I'm pointing all of this out because for the most part, these sort of differences are things I'm not really going to mention for the sake of this episode. That's a little different than I've done for other movies where I've specifically called out when they've changed names of characters from the real people. For example, even though this movie calls him Zun, Z-H-U-N, Master Ip's real son, Ip Chun, C-H-U-N, was born in 1924. So that would mean when the movie begins in 1935, he'd be about nine years old, which is about how old the child looks at the dinner table in the first scene. So rather than assuming that the filmmakers went about changing the character's name, I'm going to chalk that up to my lack of knowledge of the Cantonese language and overlook any other similar changes in characters' names. With all of that said, if you do speak Cantonese and are aware of some of the differences between the names of the real people and the characters in the movie, by all means, please let me know. I'd be happy to come back and update this episode. But that leads me to a much bigger issue here. Two issues, actually. The... Two big issues that, quite honestly, almost made me not want to create this episode. The root problem here has to do with tracking down the information to compare history with the movie. Let me explain. With names like Ip Man or Yip Man, it's pretty easy to know the two names are talking about the same person the movie is because, well, he's famous. But documentation and reports aren't nearly as good for some of the lesser figures in the movie. For example, after this introductory scene with a friendly duel between Donnie Yen's version of Ip Man and Zi Hui Chen's version of Master Liu, we're introduced to yet another character, Jin, J-I-N. In the movie, Jin is played by Sui Wang Fan. Is Jin a real person? Maybe. Try as I did, I was unable to find any sort of documentation to prove his existence. And that goes back to what I mentioned before. Is it that the filmmakers invented Jin or just that there's a language difference and his real name in Cantonese isn't anything like Jin? Or maybe he's just not famous enough to have documentation from 1930s China pre-World War II still surviving today. All of those are plausible scenarios. Probably the two people who would know best of all would be Edmund Wong and Tai Li Chan, the two talented writers who crafted the story behind the movie It Man. Unfortunately, I've been unsuccessful in getting a hold of them to find out. And that's one of the issues, and it leaves us with trying to sift through historical documentation. For every other episode, it really hasn't been much of an issue. But then we run into the other wall, the language barrier I mentioned earlier. Am I not finding any mention of Jin because he's not real, or because I'm looking for the wrong name? Something else I haven't mentioned is that there's a lot of slang used in Foshan, So while Cantonese is the primary language there, slang terms make things even more difficult to track down when you're trying to find the origins of things. Hopefully, this isn't coming across as an excuse, but I just wanted to clarify some of the challenges that I had researching this episode up front because, quite honestly, it's been really tough to find a lot of the solid facts. So, as I offered before with the names of people, if you have any more facts that can help us understand the difference between the movie and history, I'd encourage you to join the Base on a True Story community on Facebook and just let everybody know. With all of that said, even with these two big walls blocking a lot of what we can see of real history, that doesn't mean the entire true story for It Man is shrouded in mystery. Going back to the movie and when the character of Jin 
we know from one of the scenes where Jin talks about his northern style of kung fu being better than Ip Man's southern style. That implies Jin is from northern China. And we know from history that Ip Man seemed to have a bit of an issue with northerners. In fact, there were four types of people who Ip Man refused to teach. Number one, northern Chinese or foreigners who were heavily built. Number two, children under the age of 13. Number three, anyone who Ip Man thought might be a criminal. And number four, anyone that he thought had to have, well, less than high mental understanding. Basically, anybody that Ip Man thought was stupid. So even though we don't really know if the events with Jin happened the way we saw in the movie, it seemed that Ip Man must have had some sort of a beef with his countrymen from the north. Speaking of which, there's a moment I love in the movie. Well, there's many moments I love about this movie, but the one I'm referring to happens when the character of Jin mocks Ip Man's fighting style, Wing Chun. Jin says something to the effect of, show me how a man can fight like a woman. Then Ip Man replies calmly, explaining that good kung fu doesn't depend on age or sex. It's simply about how well you fight. You'll understand that soon. I think if Ip Man had a mic at that moment, he would have dropped it. Anyway, that's the lead into just one of the many amazing fight sequences in the film. Unfortunately, there's no documentation I could find to prove that this fight ever happened. But there was a moment earlier in Ip Man's life that could have led him to be the calm person we seem to see in the film. This took place while Ip Man was a teenager living in Hong Kong, attending St. Stephen's. Because of his earnest practicing of Kung Fu, Ip Man had yet to be defeated by any of his classmates. As is often the case, when you never lose, you tend to start to get that feeling that you never will lose. That happened to Ip Man. He was good. And he knew it. All of that changed one Sunday afternoon when one of his classmates said he knew of someone in town who might make a good sparring partner. It was a friend of a classmate's father, apparently. It man accepted at once. After all, he'd never lost. He wouldn't lose this time either. When he showed up for the friendly sparring, a pleasant middle-aged man greeted him. After formalities, this man, whose name it man didn't even know, told him not to hold back. According to him, even though it was a friendly match, the middle-aged man told Ip Man to come at him with all that he had, basically saying, whatever you got, I can take it. Not in so many words, but that's the gist. Anyway, this proceeded to do nothing more than piss off Ip Man, who was instantly determined to take this from a friendly sparring to a full-fledged beating. And he tried, but he failed. Ip Man's barrage of punches were no match for this opponent's speed. Within a matter of moments, Ip Man had lost the match. Upset and quite humiliated at his defeat, Ip Man left without saying much. Then, about a week later, Ip Man heard from the middle-aged man he had fought with earlier. This man wanted to meet with Ip Man again. At first, he thought he'd ignore the summons, thought he wasn't good enough. Then something changed, and Ip Man did go back to meet with the man. And this is something that not everyone can do. After failing so mightily to turn around and make yourself better out of it. For you see, the man who defeated Ip Man was none other than Leong Bik. If you remember from earlier, Leong Bik was the man who trained Ip Man. Even though Ip Man's pride was something that swelled so high only to be deflated after such a devastating defeat, he didn't dwell on it. Instead, he swallowed his pride and was determined to learn all he could from the man who defeated him, Leong Bik. So while this event happened much earlier in Ip Man's life than the encounter between Jin and Ip Man in the movie, since there's no way to prove if what we saw in the movie actually happened, I still wanted to share that little story because it helps give us some insight into the type of person that Ip Man was. As a teenager, he was just like you and me, thinking he's the best. Granted, he was a lot better as a teenager than I will ever be at martial arts. But the lesson in that story is that even though he thought he was the best, he learned a very hard lesson that there's almost always someone out there better. Rather than hiding from that, he learned from it to make himself even better than he was before. Back in the movie, there is a bit of text on screen that explains a moment when Ip Man's life changes forever. It happened, according to the movie, on July 7th, 1937, when something called the Marco Polo Bridge Incident occurred 
and Imperial Japan invaded China. The movie doesn't talk about what the Marco Polo Bridge incident was, but for the purposes of our story today, all we find out is that the Japanese have occupied Ip Man's hometown of Foshan. But what the movie is referring to here is an event that actually happened, and there is more to the story. You see, the Japanese occupation of China didn't start on July 7th, 1937, like the movie is implying. It actually started six years earlier in 1931, when the Imperial Japanese Empire took over Manchuria in northeastern China, north of modern-day North Korea. Remember that Foshan is in southern China, so we're talking about 2,000 miles or 3,200 kilometers away from where Ip Man lived. Nevertheless, it's the same country, and that occupation didn't help the relationship between the Japanese and Chinese governments. Tensions continued to rise with more and more Chinese citizens around the whole of China finding themselves with a growing distaste for the Japanese. Then, on July 7, 1937, the event the movie talks about happened. The Marco Polo Bridge incident is something that happened on, well, the Marco Polo Bridge. That's a bridge that was built somewhere around the year 1200 and earned its name when the famous explorer mentioned it in his travels. Those records made their way back to the Western world, and that's why Westerners today refer to it as the Marco Polo Bridge. For a bit of geography, that bridge is near what we now know as Beijing. So that's still about 1,300 miles or 2,000 kilometers to the north of Foshan. On the evening of July 6th, some Japanese forces had occupied a train station near the bridge. The next day, a small detachment of Japanese soldiers demanded that they be led into the nearby city of Wanping. There's a lot of controversy over the years as to exactly what happened here, but many historians think that the Japanese troops wanted in so they could try to find one of their soldiers that had gone missing. Even though we don't know exactly what happened, we know the Chinese troops in the city refused to let the Japanese in, and shots rang out. Later that night, the Japanese tried to get into the city by force, but were repelled. By the time the sun rose on July 8th, reinforcements from both sides had begun to arrive, and things began to get out of hand, culminating in the Chinese army attacking the Japanese at the bridge at about 4.50 a.m. That began the Battle of Beiping Tianjin, and along with it, the Second Sino-Japanese War, full-scale war between the Chinese and Japanese nations. Going back to the movie, you'll also notice the filmmakers made a pretty big change in the movie when talking about the Japanese invasion. Before it, everything is bright and vibrant. After the Japanese occupation, the colors in the movie become more desaturated and darker. Of course, the world didn't physically get more desaturated after the Marco Polo Bridge incident, but that battle kicking off the war ended in Japanese victory and led to a spreading occupation of China by the Imperial Japanese Empire. So, it's certainly something that made life darker for the citizens of China who were affected. For the purposes of our story, though, it can mark something of a turning point. You see, this is about the point in the film where a lot of the main storyline seems to diverge from history. For instance, after the Japanese occupation, Donnie Yen's version of Ip Man tells his wife that he'll have to go out and start looking for a job. He goes on to say he never needed one before, but he needs one now. The implication here is that because of his wealthy upbringing and wealthy parents, he's never really needed to work. Well, that's not true. Even though Ip Man grew up in a wealthy family, and we don't know the specifics about his finances, we know from history that Ip Man actually got a job as a policeman soon after he returned to Foshan from Hong Kong at the age of 24. We don't really know how long he held this job for, but we do know that after the events in the movie, namely after the Japanese occupation during World War II, Itman returned to Foshan and once again became a policeman. There's also no indication in the historical documents that Itman was forced to work shoveling coal, like the movie suggests. Probably the biggest inaccuracy in the film, though, is, well, pretty much the entire premise of the battle between Itman and General Mira. General Mira, by the way, is played by Hiroyuki Akiuchi. While there's no documentation I could find to indicate General Mira was a real person, it's hard to say that there's absolutely no proof. After all, Mura was a common Japanese surname of the time, and many records from the Imperial Japanese Empire were destroyed or lost during the course of World War II. What is true, though, is 
that word of Ip Man's talents somehow made their way to the Japanese military. They, in turn, tried to get Ip Man to train their troops. Sort of like what we saw General Mira ask Ip Man to do, albeit with different means to reach those ends. Unfortunately, we don't know a lot of the details about what happened, so we can't really do a scene-by-scene comparison. But there's no historical proof of Ip Man fighting in tournaments like we saw in the movie, or even battling a Japanese general like we saw in the big epic fight at the end. In fact, the true story is quite different than what we saw in the movie. Remember when we learned earlier that Ip Man worked as a policeman and there wasn't any proof of him shoveling coal for work like we saw? Well, a big part of that is probably because what really happened was that when the Japanese Imperial Army wanted Ip Man to train their soldiers, he refused. We don't know the capacity by which they wanted him to train their soldiers. By that, I mean it's not likely they wanted or expected Ip Man to train millions of people, all of their soldiers, but they did want to take advantage of his expertise. When he refused, that is when the Japanese captured his family's wealth. So the movie's timeline is flipped because in the film... It wasn't until the end when the Japanese asked Ip Man to train them. In truth, it was as a result of Ip Man's refusal that he was left without his family's wealth. But he didn't go to work shoveling coal like the movie implies. He did, though, do something else that we saw in the movie. That would be training some of the people working at the cotton mill. For the most part, though, things were fairly quiet for Master Ip during the war. For two years, 1941 to 1943, he trained workers at the cotton mill and some others in exchange for financial support. Sadly, Ip Man's wife passed away somewhere around 1943, and he set about the task of raising their children alone. Yes, I I said children. In the movie, Ip Man only has one son. In truth, by the time Chiung passed away, Ip Man had two sons and a daughter. And with that, we're pretty much caught up to the point in time where the movie ends. Of course, if you're a fan of the movie, then you'll know there was also Ip Man 2 and Ip Man 3. No, we're not going to compare those movies to history right now. But as the existence of sequels implies, that's not where Ip Man's story ends. According to the text at the end of the movie, Ip Man settled in Hong Kong after the war and began teaching Wing Chun. That's true, but there's more to the story. Ip Man managed to survive as a single father through the end of World War II. Then, the people of China went through yet another period of turmoil when the Chinese Civil War erupted. Well, technically one could argue that it began in 1927 and sort of took a hiatus for World War II only to pick back up after the global conflict. But the point here for our story is that by the time 1949 rolled around, the Communist Party had gained control over much of China. And, simply put, they didn't really like the political circles that Ip Man was apparently affiliated with at the time. So that is why Ip Man moved to Hong Kong after the war. Now, in case you weren't aware, despite its connection to China, Hong Kong is technically an autonomous territory. But the movie is correct in mentioning that it was here in Hong Kong when Ip Man opened his martial arts school, his first official school after the war, even though he trained many people up to this point. Despite living in Hong Kong earlier in his life and having quite a reputation in Foshan, Ip Man's school didn't take off. In fact, it did fairly poorly. His classes mostly consisted of drills, techniques, and sparring with other students, but there wasn't really a syllabus for the training. As a result, many students came and went. While it didn't help his success immediately to have his students leave, sometimes only months after starting their training, many of those students went off and sparred with more well-known martial artists in the region and won. And so they wanted to learn where these students had learned from. So these victories helped increase Ip Man's reputation and, by extension, brought in more students. Eight years after arriving in Hong Kong, a 16-year-old boy by the name of Li Jun Fan was one of those students who joined Ip Man's classes. This brought a lot of controversy from the other students. You see, Li Jun Fan was born in San Francisco. He was American even though his father had immigrated to the U.S. from China. That was enough for some students to leave, not wanting to train alongside someone of mixed blood. But Ip Man continued to train Li Jun Fan. Maybe he saw something of himself in the young fighter. You see, soon after Li was born, his family moved to Hong Kong. That was just before the Japanese occupation began. So he too 
had to live under Japanese occupation, albeit as a child. Maybe Ip Man saw something special in him. Maybe he saw a bit of his own children in the young boy. We don't really know. But what we do know is that in 1955, Ip Man decided to offer private training to the young Li Jun Fan. That only lasted a few years, though. And in 1959, after a fight at school with someone who his parents feared were tied to organized crime in Hong Kong, Li Jun Fan was sent back to the United States to live with his aunt in San Francisco. Today, we know Li Jun Fan by a different name, Bruce Lee. For years after this, Ip Man continued training martial artists. Sensing the inevitable, Ip Man decided to turn to film for another reason. He didn't want to become a movie star like Bruce Lee, but instead wanted to capture the system he'd helped build into a respected form of martial arts, Wing Chun. He wanted to make sure the legacy of the system he'd established would live on beyond his years. And so, in October of 1972, and at his request, Ip Man's two sons and one of his students, Lao Han Lam, filmed the legendary martial artist practicing his now-famous Wing Chun system. It's some of the only footage we have of Ip Man, and I'll make sure to put a link to it over on BasedOnATrueStoryPodcast.com. At this point, Ip Man was 79 years old, and despite still being incredibly fast was slowed as he fought through incredible pain to be filmed performing the drills he'd run countless times before. You see, despite a lifetime of exercise that comes from practicing martial arts, Ip Man also had a lifetime of smoking cigarettes and opium that was catching up with him. Then, just weeks after shooting that footage, it did. On December 2nd, 1972, Ip Man passed away into legend. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan LeFeb. If you want to learn more about the real Ip Man, I would really recommend a book called Ip Man Portrait of a Kung Fu Master by none other than Ip Man's son, Ip Chung. Before we get to the answer to the two truths and a lie game, I would like to thank my two latest patrons, Abhijit Gaya and Meredith Mateo. And I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Feel free to let me know and I can I can correct that. Again, pronunciations, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for your support. And if you're wondering what sort of things I do with the money that your support provides, it's doing things like buying the book I just mentioned. Although, honestly, I didn't use a lot of the information from that book in this episode. After all, as we learned, the fight against the Japanese general didn't happen. But if it had happened, it certainly would have been in there, so you never know until you get the material. Sometimes research material has great information, sometimes it doesn't. But I truly appreciate your support to help me be able to get it and make the show that much better. Plus, there are a ton of great photos and information about the legendary martial artist in that book. Now, I usually buy a digital copy of research materials, but sometimes books aren't available digitally, and this is one of those. So, actually, Tell you what, if you want my copy of Ip Man, Portrait of a Kung Fu Master that I bought for the research of this episode, listen through to the end of the show and I'll, you'll find out how you can win it. Before we get to that, here is a great five-star review from Boomer Podcast Fan entitled Historical Fiction Lover's Dream Podcast, and I quote, So glad I stumbled upon Dan's podcast as an avid historical fiction reader, a big fan of films, TV shows that are based on a true story, and a huge podcast listener. This is my dream podcast. Dan delivers content in a very engaging manner, is very entertaining, and produces a top quality audio. Can't wait for the next episode. Thanks, Dan, for what you do. Keep on messaging. End quote. Thank you so much, Boomer Podcast fan. I'm so glad you stumbled upon my show, too. I can't help but wonder with a username like Boomer Podcast fan, are you from Oklahoma as well? It's still crazy to me that people are taking the time to find and listen to the show that I put out in my home studio. So thank you for not only doing that, but letting me know by leaving a review. That's awesome. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, the real Ip Man never fought a Japanese general like we saw in the movie. Number two, Ip Man lived in Hong Kong before World War II. 
Number three, Ip Man never trained anyone at a cotton mill. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number three. As we learned, Ip Man actually did train some people at the cotton mill, or a cotton mill. I'm sure there's more than one cotton mill. I highly doubt it happened like what we saw in the movie, and there's no documentation that I could find to show that he trained them to help fight off thugs like we saw in the film. But instead, the evidence suggests that he trained them as a job after the Japanese seized his family's wealth. Alrighty, one last thing. As I mentioned earlier, I picked up a copy of Ip Man, Portrait of a Kung Fu Master. It's a short book, but it was a great read and it has some great pictures in it. Now, if you want it, I'll send it to you. But, hmm, there's more than one of you listening to this and I only have one book, so how do I, how do I pick? Uh, tell you what, let's do this. Hop over to either Apple Podcasts or Facebook and leave a rating and review for the show. Then email me a screenshot of the review. Then I'll take everyone's names that email me. You have to email me that so I can really tie in the Apple Podcast username with an email to reach back out. But I'll take all those names and put them into a virtual hat of sorts and randomly pick one winner of the book. If you're that lucky person, I'll reach out to you to get an address to send the book to. That's it. Sound good? Awesome. If you have any questions about that, feel free to email me. I'm dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com, or you can reach out to me on social media, either on Twitter, where I'm at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B, or on Facebook and Instagram, I'm Based on a True Story Podcast. And don't forget, you can also pick up your own Based on a True Story t-shirts and merch over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash merch. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.